All right, welcome everybody. Thanks for tuning in. Um, this is not a video I really want to make. It's not something I'm super excited to talk about because I know that there's lots of strong emotions involved and uh, a lot of people have very strong opinions on this. And so uh, I just want to do this with grace and I don't want to... Uh, the reason I didn't really want to film it was because I don't want people to view me or view our church and think of a political issue. To me, this is a, uh, a highly moral issue, and uh, it's a question of ethics and a question of, you know, as Christians, how should we think about things like this, like abortion, like Roe v. Wade being overturned and all this kind of stuff. And so I just wanted to humbly talk about this from a Christian perspective, and uh, I would ask that you be kind in the comment section, be respectful of others' opinions, and um, yeah, that's, I mean, I know that this is a, a very, like I said, a very heated conversation, but on one hand, there's a lot of people that are um, talking a lot about this and not with much grace, and then on the other hand, there's a lot of those who are afraid to say anything uh, for the sake of, you know, not wanting to offend people, which I get. Um, and we don't want to unnecessarily put obstacles in front of people. And so this is one of those conversations, one of those topics that um, is easily avoided because we don't want to invite controversy. But as I mentioned before, I think this is a really uh, important issue. I, again, I don't see this as a political issue. I see this as a moral one. And as Christians who care about human life and the sanctity of it, um, as, as people who are image bearers of God, I feel like it's important to open the door on this conversation. So um, this video is going to be directed to people that I'm assuming are Christians, but specifically teenagers who are uh, growing up trying to learn what it means to follow Jesus, especially in the midst of um, highly debated topics such as this. Um, and I know that there's uh, all kinds of stuff out there on social media and stuff, all kinds of perspectives that are coming from non-Christians, coming from uh, politically motivated speakers, coming from uh, even other Christians that I would say are not uh, biblically sound or, or medically clear or historically accurate when it comes to this conversation. So my hope is to be informative, to uh, talk a little bit and maybe dispel some myths that are out there and things that are just being retweeted or reshared and not really thought deeply about. Um, so maybe correcting some misconceptions about this issue. Um, and also I'm going to share kind of just my biblical perspective on this as a youth pastor and as somebody um, who, who is coming at this from, from that perspective. So um, I'm going to get into that, the moral side of it a little later in the video. But the way I see it is there's, there's two different conversations that are being conflated. One is what Roe v. Wade being overturned actually means from a historical and a legal standpoint. And the second has to do with the morality of abortions themselves from a Christian perspective. Okay, so real quick, one more thing before we get into the video, and that is that I want to make sure I make abundantly clear that there is grace for everybody. Um, I, I realize that even though this is directed at teenagers and, and specifically Christian teens, I understand that there are going to be people who are watching this who um, do not fall into that category, and maybe even Christians who have had abortions and stuff. And so I want to make sure it is absolutely clear that there is always room for the grace of Jesus, and this video is not a condemnation on anybody. Um, the, the grace of Jesus is even at the foot of the cross, and there is not any one of us who have committed a worse sin than anybody else. All of us are guilty under our own sin um, and all made clean at the foot of Jesus. So uh, I, I want to make that abundantly clear. If you've had an abortion or if you've, you know, this, this is not a uh, condemnation of you and this is not saying there's no way back. This, this is not any of that. This is just simply specifically for, for Christians and, and teenagers who are hearing a whole lot of information and a lot of misinformation about this topic. I wanted to make the facts straight in this video and watching this back I see I, I wasn't quite as clear on the in the midst of you know the the content of this video please don't hear that this is a condemnation on anybody. This is just I mean again this is a heated conversation and uh, and so I just 
please give me grace as well if I don't communicate things the best way. I just really want to find the best way to get the information out. And, uh, and I do believe if we're going to spur on a change in our culture for this gener generation and future generations, our, our thinking about these kinds of things has to change. So please don't misunderstand um, some of the content in, in the video for a condemnation on anybody because that's not the intent of this. And if you have questions or if you want to talk further about any of this, please let me know. Also, I apologize. I just gotten over being sick when I filmed this, so my voice is a little more rough and I had some sinus issues. I apologize about that. I'm actually still dealing with some of that. So anyway, on with the video. So myth number one would be Roe v. Wade being overturned makes abortions illegal in the United States. This is just not true. This is stuff I keep seeing repeated everywhere. This, that's just not what that means. All Roe v. Wade being overturned means is that it defederalizes the law making process and gives legislative power back to the individual states. Um, so the justices all wrote uh, thought pieces about this decision, about this ruling, um, and I encourage you to read those, or at least read the highlights of those before um, forming an opinion on this, because uh, in particular, Justice Clarence Thomas makes this abundantly clear in his statements. He clarifies um, the reasons why they ruled this way, how um, abortion is not a constitutional right and talks about some of the controversy around Roe v. Wade and why it was originally um, ruled the way it was and made the law of the land and how this is actually a, it's not taking away freedoms, it's not oppressing women, it's actually giving more freedom because the Supreme Court is, is a court. It, it's a judicial branch. It's not a legislative one. It's not meant to make laws or adjustments to the Constitution. It's to interpret the Constitution and, and rule cases uh, with that in mind. So he talks about that a lot and how this is actually, this gives more freedom to the people because people feel differently about it. So it gives more of that legislative power to your elected officials. So you can actually have a say in this. It's not something that's federalized and the same and equal amongst all states. So this is this is a play for more freedom. This is a rare occurrence because this is a, uh, a branch of the government that is actually giving up power and giving it back to the states. So it, th that's positive for, for a lot of reasons. And so um, this does not mean that abortion is gonna become illegal everywhere. That's just, that's just not true. That's a talking point. That's inaccurate. Another myth is that this is a loss for freedom and policymakers will come after contraceptives next. Uh, no, again, this was addressed in the statements released by the justices about this decision. Um, they explicitly say there's no motive for that and uh, there's no desire or any plans to pursue such action. This is just something that people who don't like the overturning of Roe versus Wade are saying. All right, another myth. Uh, women won't be able to get the care they need if they can't get abortions or legal abortions prevent women from dying. Um, what about ectopic pregnancies, etc., etc.? Again, it, this is a talking point that people are saying it's not true. Um, as I'll discuss later, there's there's a pretty big difference between like ectopic pregnancies um, or where a DNC is required and stuff like that. And that that's that's different from like going and getting a an abortion. All right, um, and and legal abortions are not preventing women from dying. Okay, if the, the idea being if it goes back to where it's illegal, then then women will go to back alleys and you know do risky abortion stuff. Like the, that's just that that was a talking point created in the 70s. There's nothing to back that. Um, there's lots of research that's been done to to demonstrate that. If you look it up, um, documentaries even that have been made to talk about this. So um, e even the pill, uh, which is legal, is a dangerous thing where complications can occur. You're literally poisoning the fetus and uh, and there are complications that can come from that so I encourage you to, to maybe research that a little bit more before just uh, hopping on the bandwagon of you know women not being able to get the care that, that they need that's just that's just not true there are plenty of ways that that women can get the health care that they need that uh, does not include abortion all right here's a big one my body my choice right 
Now, there was a study done by a guy named Stephen Jacobs uh, where he, he surveyed over 5,000 biologists and he asked them what their stance on, what their opinion, their professional, scientific, biological opinion on when life begins was. And over 95% agreed that human life begins at fertilization, AKA conception. And this isn't just some right wing, like they're all a bunch of conservative biologists, you know, fighting that's not what this is, right? The, the majority of those biologists identified as liberal, democrat, non-religious, and pro-choice. But the point being that even they, pro-choice people, concede that, well, yeah, but life technically, from a biological standpoint, begins at conception. Um, and then they just, they still may be pro-choice, um, but they acknowledge that they are killing a separate human life. So the my body, my choice thing, like uh, if you want to get your appendix taken out or if you, you got to do something uh, else with your body or get a surgery, like I don't care, that's, that's your choice, you do that. But um, the minute you start talking about terminating the life that is growing inside of you, that is not your body, that's separate DNA, separate chromosomes, and its own body unique from the mother. And scientifically, there's just no getting around that. That body is not your choice. Another myth is that no one gets late-term abortions, right? So one of the positives uh, that a lot of people are saying about Roe v. Wade is that, hey, it, this eliminates those late-term abortions where, where the baby would be viable outside the womb. And a lot of people on the opposing side are saying, well, nobody gets late-term abortions. The reality is a lot of states, including Colorado, legalize abortion up to the ninth month. That doesn't become legalized because it's not happening. It, it becomes legal because it is happening it is legalized and it's being pushed to become more legal in other states um, because people want it to happen and because it is happening. To say that it's not is just naive. And as I'll talk here in a little bit more depth shortly, the abortion industry is a lucrative industry looking to, to where it can expand and, and continue to make more money. And they're able to do that when they can perform abortions later and later in, pre in pregnancy. And graphic discussion warning, right? When abortions occur later in pregnancy, they literally have to slit the throat or break the neck of the baby in order to abort, right? That, that's, that's not necessary. It's viable outside the womb at that point, and you can terminate the pregnancy without terminating the child. This poses a huge moral thing for me, but uh, as it does for most people by polling data, um, and in fact, a lot of the polling data is misleading because they'll say most people are in favor of abortions, but once you start asking questions like this, then they're like, well, no, I'm not in favor for that. So it's, you know, there's, there's lots of mixed uh, information out there or limited information that uh, can lead you to believe that more is true. More people feel a certain way about something than what is actually real. The reality is this is a big deal and this is something that is talked about a lot. There are late term abortions that do happen on a regular basis and so Roe v. Wade being overturned is a good thing because it gives states the opportunity to make stuff like that illegal and that's what I will be voting for in the upcoming elections. Okay, another myth. Abortion alleviates social and racial inequality. Nope. Uh, one of the founders of Planned Parenthood, Margaret Sanger, she actually wanted to wipe out the black population by selling abortions to them. This is not even debated. Even the New York Times wrote an article in July of 2020 noting that the Planned Parenthood of Greater New York removed Sanger's name from the clinic because of her harmful connections to the eugenics movement. This is one of the core tenets of the abortion industry, but they don't like to talk about that nowadays. And even today, people of color are more likely to get an abortion than any other race. And if that doesn't hurt racial equality, I don't know what does. All right, another myth. Most abortions are medically necessary. All right, uh, this, this just is not true. Um, there, there's a doctor named... Uh, uh, Dr. Stephen Hammond, and he uh, used to be pro-choice, used to perform abortions. He performed over 700 of them. Um, and he actually, he, he talks actively about this nowadays. He says abortion is never medically necessary. And he talks about how there's this attempt to conflate terms, right? The medical profession uses terms like abortion and coding, things like missed abortion, incomplete abortion, tubal abortion, or inevitable abortion. And the word abortion that, that is used there is used in medical terms, but they're all referring to a miscarriage. 
right? In those cases, it would be medically necessary to remove that abnormal pregnancy for, for many possible reasons, about 25% of all pregnancies in, in miscarriage. Um, but those are not the same thing as like going into a clinic and getting an abortion, right? And Roe v. Wade is not referring to this, right? So having a, a, a DNC because a, a baby died in utero is not the same thing as getting an abortion. An ectopic pregnancy is not the same thing as ending an otherwise healthy life in the womb. Abortions are the removing or ending of an otherwise perfectly viable life of an unborn baby at any stage for the purpose of convenience, uh, contraceptive measures, or any other medically unnecessary termination of pregnancy. I've even seen uh, on social media doctors, like one in particular here in Franklin, that, that use this as one of their main talking points about why they switch from pro-life to pro-choice because of, you know, the medical necessity to remove what she called uh, to, to, for, to have abortions was what she called, but it's, it's to remove abnormal pregnancies, right? Uh, a, a baby that's growing in the fallopian tube because it didn't make it down to the uterus um, does pose a great threat to uh, to mom, and the baby's not going to survive. It can't be viable there in the tube. It has to make it to the uterus. So when that happens, which does happen, that needs to be taken out. That's not what Roe v. Wade is talking about. Okay, that's 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 not what's on the table of discussion when it comes to Roe v. Wade. So when people get all upset about stuff like that, um, there, there are laws in place that protect those kinds of situations, right? Roe v. Wade being overturned doesn't mean you can't do that anymore, right? And, and so anyway, I'll, I'll, I, I'll talk about that a little more in a second. But I talked a minute ago about how abortion is a lucrative, it's a multi-billion dollar industry. And that's how Planned Parenthood makes a profit and continues to grow. And they've paid a lot of money to get you to think that most of what they do is care for women. But the reality is abortions are their bread and butter. There are people who have worked in the abortion industry who are who no longer work in it and say this is how we were trained to sell abortions. Um, they, they literally will cover up cases of rape in, in order to try to sell an abortion. They don't protect the, the women who are victims of abuse um, by reporting it because well, they'll, they'll say your, your name will get caught up in it and will be out there because of the police report. So it's just better just to get the abortion now kind of thing. And, and it allows this, um, this cycle and this pattern of abuse to continue. And so no, uh, or, or organizations like Planned Parenthood do not care for women, right? They are trying to sell abortions. Lila Rose is a, a pro-life advocate and journalist. She has done a lot of undercover investigative work. In fact, uh, she once talked to the police chief in LA and he had never once received a report of suspected abuse from an abortion clinic in all his decades of working in the department. These are situations where obviously young people, especially teenagers are coming in wanting abortions and, uh, and aren't they the most likely who are someone who would be a victim of abuse. Uh, uh, there's, there's statutory rape cases that happen where people get pregnant, right? None of them are reported from, from these abortion clinics. Why? Because the goal for those clinics are not to help the women. The goal for those clinics are to make money by selling abortions. And that's just the reality of the industry. If you don't believe that, you're being naive. And I mean that in, in the most loving way possible, but, but do more research. Because choosing to not see that is, I think, one of the big issues when it comes to this conversation. There is financial incentive in the abortion industry. It is not about caring for women. All right, I'll get off my soapbox and, uh, and continue. Another myth is that abortions are a medical decision, not a moral one. So here is where we get into more of the moral discussions around abortion itself, not about like what what Roe v. Wade means. And this is, again, this is where I'm coming from as a Christian, from a Christian perspective, and why I strongly stand on the pro-life side of things. And uh, and so, so here, let's just talk about, um, I'm going to talk about a lot of the things that people are saying and um, moral arguments or justifications for abortions and stuff like that, and why I don't think that they hold any water. So, uh, heart disease. It's the number one killer globally, 16% of all total deaths in the US. Um, that's more than 800,000 people each year that die from cardiovascular disease. You know how many abortions occur each year? Well, the answer is no, because you can't get an exact number because states are not legally required to report abortion numbers. And there's states like California who have chosen not to report their numbers. So there's two ways to gather that information is, and one is from the CDC and it's just 
based on the numbers that people have reported, okay? So the CDC reported 629,898 abortions uh, in the year 2019, okay? The other metric or uh, organization that gets information, makes estimates, is the Gutmacher Institute. And uh, they, they report based on estimates uh, on the clinics that, that don't report those numbers, right? So um, they, they uh, if you go into any of their stuff, they've got research dating back to Roe v. Wade where they, they've collected these numbers and stuff. But in 2019, their number uh, was 930,160 abortions. Okay, and, and they report that there's been approximately 60 million abortions that have occurred in the United States since 1973. Now, that averages out to 1.2 million per year. Okay, and actually that's a, that's a very conservative estimate um, because that data actually only goes from 73 to 2017. And it's, it's technically 63 million, not 60, but just for the sake of like, just to, to give a little bit, right? that still averages way more deaths per year than people who die from the number one killer, which is heart disease, right? So by the numbers alone, you could say that abortions terminating the life of an unborn child is the biggest killer in the United States, right? More people die from that than they do from anything else, right? That's no small thing. This is a huge moral conundrum. We've got to talk about this and we've got to talk about this realistically. So, Knowing that those are the numbers that we're talking about, okay? So now let's talk about the some different situations where, where people will justify abortion. So a lot of people say, well, okay, what about cases of rape or incest? And so my first question would be, okay, are you, are you bringing up cases of rape and incest because we should make laws regarding that, but all other abortions are bad, right? But we can make exceptions for that. Or are you using that extreme case to justify all other abortions? Because that's a key question if someone's, if, you, if you're going to use that as your argument for why abortion should be allowed, then let's talk about just that issue, okay? Because cases of rape and incest make up less than 2% of all abortions. In fact, 1% of abortions are be reported because of rape, and only 0.5% are due because of cases of rape and incest, okay? So more than 98% of abortions are attributed to the following reasons, okay? Like, having a baby would dramatically change my life can't afford a baby now, don't want to be a single mother or having relationship problems, or have completed my childbearing. So statistically speaking, those are the reasons that people give for having an abortion, okay? Over 98% of those are not rape and incest. So the overturning of Roe v. Wade, which could potentially uh, give states the opportunity to make it illegal to have all those other kinds of, of abortions, but now you can get into the, the moral question of, okay, well, should abortion even be allowed for those, for the case of rape and incest? And I have a real problem with that too, um, for, for several reasons, okay? One being that two wrongs don't make a right, right? If, if someone punches you, you don't have the right to then go punch somebody else, right? Rape and incest don't justify murdering the child. Okay, the child is an innocent, separate human life in this. And, and you know, people list, you know, the, the not being ready, not being financially ready, or don't want the, the child to be raised in less than ideal circumstances, right? Th those are all separate arguments from, do we kill this life? Okay, I, I understand that they're, they're tied and the, some of the reasonings are tied, but those are separate things, okay? The socioeconomics of a, a certain situation or a certain uh, baby that might be raped, that, 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 that doesn't matter. That is irregardless, right? Some, some of God's best work in people all throughout the Bible are done with people that were born in less than ideal situations. God has a plan for each and every person, and each and every person is made in the image of God. So regardless of the origin story, whether it came out of good or, or bad things, it's still a human life and two wrongs do not justify a right. I understand that from an emotional level, that's much harder to grapple with in those extreme cases, um, but you, you have to think about this uh, from, from a God perspective. God created life. Why? The reasons may have been bad from a human standpoint, may have, may have come out of sin, but that's still human life. And we don't get to play God. We don't get to interfere in those situations. 
right? And anytime we do, anytime we try to label somebody as less than human all throughout history, that's not ever uh, looked upon very well. Being financially unready or any of those other reasons don't justify taking a life. We need to stop being offended by God's righteous law. It seems like a lot of Christians are trying not to offend people by saying what they actually believe. But it, like if someone steals, it's not our job to be like, well, they were probably hungry, right? It doesn't, it doesn't matter. Just don't steal. It's not right to the person you are stealing from. We don't have to apologize for that. God makes laws for a reason and he is righteous. So when he says don't murder, it's not our job to be like, well, their finances wouldn't be the best. It wouldn't be the best situation for the kid. Listen, let's say there's a pregnant person trying to decide whether or not to get an abortion. Dad's not in the picture. She's living on food stamps. She'll be out of a job for a while after having the kid. It just won't be a good situation for that kid. Now, let's say there's another woman in the exact same situation, except she had her baby a year and a half ago. So her child is now 18 months old, but her circumstances still are, are, are not the best. Right? Morally speaking, why is that child's right to life any different now that he's born as opposed to the one that is not yet born? The argument here is not the stage development or bodily autonomy or anything like that. The argument is about the subjective nature of the child's living situation. Right? There's a lot of people in poverty all over the world and, and that doesn't give us the right to just kill them. It is not our job to play God. It is not our job to choose what lives would be worth it and what wouldn't. In fact, talking about people that, that live in poverty all over the world, like the United States, the most privileged nation in the, in the entire world with, with more, uh, that is like more wealthy than 99% of the rest of the world. Like we have much higher rates of mental health issues, of suicide, of all kinds of stuff. Um, and people in less than ideal situations who are lower on the socioeconomical scale, they seem to be much happier, which tends to lead someone to believe that maybe happiness is not derivative of financial situation. So maybe we shouldn't make the decision on whether or not to keep a life based on those things. Well, they wouldn't have a dad. Foster care is terrible. M more should be done about the current orphans, right? None, none of those things are wrong. Okay, but it still doesn't make you the judge over who gets to live and who doesn't. Maybe God has plans for that kid. Uh, some of the greatest heroes, again, in the Bible uh, grew up in less than ideal situations. And that's often how God chooses to work through his people. He is made strong in our weakness. All right, check this out. I just want to read a passage from Luke chapter 6, right? This is, this is about Jesus healing on the Sabbath, doing miracles. So Luke chapter 6, uh, one Sabbath, Jesus was going through the grain fields and his disciples began to pick some heads of grain, rub them in their hands and eat the kernels. Some of the Pharisees asked, why are you doing this? What, what is unlawful on the Sabbath? Jesus answered them, have you ever read what David did when he and his companions were hungry? He entered the house of God and, and taking the consecrated bread, he ate what is only lawful for the priests to eat. And he also gave some to his companions. Then Jesus said to them, the son of man is Lord of the Sabbath. Well, on another Sabbath, he went into the synagogue and was teaching and a man was there whose right hand was shriveled. The Pharisees and teachers of the law were looking for a reason to accuse Jesus. So they watched him closely to see if he would heal on the Sabbath. But Jesus knew what they were thinking and said to the man with the shriveled hand, get up and stand in front of everyone. So he got up and stood there. This, this is the important part. Then Jesus said to them, the Pharisees, I ask you, which is lawful on the Sabbath? To do good or to do evil? To save life or to destroy it? He looked around at all of them and said to the man, stretch out your hand. And he did so and his hand was completely restored. But the Pharisees and the teachers of the law were furious and began to discuss one with one another what they might do to Jesus. The point is, okay, if you're if you're faced with a, a moral conundrum, with a with a an issue, okay, do we you know, do we abort the the child, the part the pregnancy, do we do we give it up for adoption? This was a terrible case of maybe even rape or whatever. Okay. Um which is better, to do harm? or to do good, to save life or to destroy it. And I, th I, th I think it really is that simple, but we, we make a lot of excuses because again, they're terrible situations. What, well, you're, you're going to invite more trauma on maybe that teenager who got pregnant out of uh, rape or whatever. Well, if there's no medical risks to the mother, then I would argue potentially that child will face even more trauma. The, the child is already traumatized. Okay, so, so regardless of what happens next, 
the damage has been done. The child was raped. There, there, or maybe the teenager was raped. Maybe the young adult was raped, right? Maybe this isn't even a minor situation. Maybe this is an adult. But in either way, it's a horrible situation. The person was raped. Um, the trauma has already happened. Now the question is, do we induce more trauma by then performing an abortion, which that person is now going to have to live with for, for the rest of their life. And if you do research, people who have abortions later uh, regret them most of the time. There's, there's, I, I understand a lot of that is not in rape situations, okay? But uh, the reality is you are making the decision to take a life, and, and most people are aware of that. So do you induce then more trauma by that? Or do you allow the person to carry the baby to term and then put it up for adoption or maybe even keep it and see it as a gift from God? You know, a lot of it has to do with perspective and outlook and prayer and all that kind of stuff. But two wrongs do not make a right. And uh, there are other questions on the table other than, well, it wasn't meant to happen, so we should get rid of it, right? And again, I understand that's highly emotional. It's emotionally charged. And I get that. And I'm not trying to uh, be uncompassionate towards the situations. But it really does necess necessitate a bigger question and a bigger conversation than what most people are having. So when in doubt, is it better to do harm, to save life, or to destroy it? Uh, I think Jesus was pretty clear on, on what the right answer is, is in that situation. I think that can be carried over to, I don't think it's much of a stretch to carry that over to situations even like this. The language used around abortion intentionally obscures the extremism of what is happening when someone terminates the life of an unborn child. Right? It's not women's rights or women's health care. It's not reproductive justice. All medical practices are supposed to aid life, remove threats, uh, treat sickness, etc. Abortion is the only medical practice that goes out of its way to stop life from continuing on the way it naturally would if left alone, right? the way God designed. Abortion is a euphemism for aborting an otherwise healthy life. Aborting means to terminate the pregnancy. Okay, well, how do you terminate the pregnancy? You end the life of the unborn by killing it either through poisoning or butchering it inside the uterus. Abortion unattached from linguistic obscurity is simply another more palatable word for murder. Right? Biologically, there's no getting around that. Historically, everyone has understood that to be the case. Again, we are made in the image of God. This is a sanctity of life question. In the moral and ethical questions surrounding it do matter. And it makes me honestly frustrated when I see a lot of Christians out there that are acting flippantly about this or posting really nasty memes or saying things that they're just resharing and have not stopped two seconds to think deeper about. Okay, this is a big deal. These are human lives that we're talking about. Okay, so those are kind of most of the myths and talking points that I've been seeing. Um, and that I've, that I've heard other people talking about. There are some further questions like what about states with trigger laws like Texas that will ban abortions altogether? Um, are there exceptions for when the mother's life is at stake? Again, the, that's a separate issue from abortion, right? And if you do your research, the, the law specifically in Texas would make an exception only to save the life of the pregnant patient or if they risk impairment of major, major bodily function, right? Now, there, there's some stories floating around about a patient dying while the doctor was on the phone with the lawyer to see if they could perform the abortion to save the mother's life. I couldn't find that story, but if it's true, I'm sure there are details about it that we're not privy to. And honestly, many stories like this uh, are intentionally obfuscated in order to mislead readers and uh, support a narrative for, for choice. And, and again, that's, that's technically not an abortion. That's a separate thing. So the, the law states, that's what we know, that's what's fact, it states that it makes exceptions for those kinds of cases. And, and if there's new red tape, then I prefer people to learn uh, or relearn the best practices and procedures for taking care of those kinds of rare situations than for the just default law of the land to allow for the mass killing of the unborn. All right, so I, I've tried my best to clarify some of those talking points that I've heard a lot about, give you some stuff to think about if you haven't thought about those aspects of this conversation before. And again, hopefully you hear in my voice, I am passionate about this because I, I do see this as a sanctity of life and a, a, a huge moral issue in our country right now. But I hope you also hear that there's grace for those who don't understand maybe the, the full 
details of the conversation. Um, and, and I would just encourage you to, if, if you've not heard any of that before, maybe, maybe get out of the echo chamber that is your social media algorithms and, and look a little deeper for some of this information uh, because it is out there, it is readily accessible. And, and if you have thoughts or questions or comments, you know, leave them below and, uh, and I'll do my best to, to answer some of those. Um, but anyway, uh, hopefully this is again a helpful uh, video for you as it hopefully adds to your discussions revolving around this topic. So I love you guys. Uh, thank you for, for making it this far if you watched the whole thing. Uh, and uh, we'll see you in the next video.